Hi, everyone. I wanted to show you Cosimo again. <laughs> he's pretty crazy. Ah. Anyways, he says hi. Um, I thought we deserved some levity since we've made it through this monster module. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Constantine and particularly the, um, the Arch of Constantine. Uh, there is Constantine now. Um, hopefully, as you've probably gathered from what you've read uh, in the text, uh, Constantine was kind of all about the colossal, right? And we see him there with that kind of extraordinary head uh, over eight feet tall. Um, we see his large eyes as they kind of cast out onto the horizon. Now, Constantine comes to power uh, in 312 at that ep epic battle of the Milvian Bridge. Uh, this is in the aftermath of the kind of breaking down of Diocletian's rule in the Tetrarchy. A uh, period of civil war breaks out. Constantine uh, faces Max Ten Tentius uh, and ultimately will prevail. It's such a big deal because he accredits his victory to his vision that he has of a Christian cross. And uh, thus we see the beginning of the great pagan empire of Rome uh, be becoming Christian. Um, and we also start to see this in uh, architecture as well. Um, let's go to the next slide, hold on. Um, that large colossal statue of Constantine, uh, will be placed here, right, in the Basilica Nova, this massive uh, complex, uh, very much done in the same kind of architectural vocabulary of the great baths of Caracalla. We see that brick face concrete with these massive arches, right, um, here, and a similarly large barrel vaulted roof. Uh, these large um, arches allow light to pour into this interior space. Now the Basilica um, or the Basilica Nova or the Basilica of Constantine was already in construction uh, when Constantine came to power. He will claim it as his own, finish it, uh, and will become the kind of seat of uh, bureaucratic offices and uh, law court. Um, here is an artist rendition of what it looked like in the time of Constantine. There we can see that apse. This is that massive uh, statue of Constantine. It was actually modeled on a statue of Jupiter, uh, the supreme being. Um, and this kind of turn to the colossal, of course, references uh, this kind of sense of superpower, um, uh, kind of optimus. Um, you know, ruler. We also get a sense of the fenestration or the windows and the type of light coming in uh, afforded by these growing vaults of the ceiling. Now, this is going to be an important architectural form, as we're going to see um, in the uh, upcoming week um, when we turn to Christian architecture, because, of course, this might look familiar, um, this long rectangular shape. Um, the basilica, interestingly, was entered through the side in the classical world but as we are going to learn um, the basilica will become the favored model for what will be a christian church uh, and of course they're going to change that entrance point from the side uh, to the end and we will see uh, these large rectangular forms become the naves of the large christian churches um, of rome once Constantine converts the empire to Christianity. Now in 313, he does proclaim um, the um, Edict of Milan. Uh, this is very important in Roman history because it legalizes Christianity. And then later, um, Constantine will become a Christian on his deathbed. And that is when uh, the entire empire uh, shifts.
Okay, what I want to look at here is that Arch of Constantine, uh, that kind of magnificent arch, which probably of no surprise uh, depicts the glorious Battle of the Milvian Bridge. It's an homage uh, to it. Um, and as you can see, it's larger than any of the arches we've seen thus far. Um, the Arch of Titus and the Arch of Trajan. We are now looking at a triple bayed arch, right? That contains three different arches. Um, now, as you can see, the um, decoration just fills that entire front uh, section of the arch here operating very much like a, like a billboard. Now, one of the interesting things about the Arch of Constantine uh, is the way in which Constantine is going to source the uh, imagery on the front of the, of, of the arch. Now, what we start to see is the use of what is called spoilia. And this is basically when someone takes... Um, works of art from another monument and just basically takes them and places them onto a new monument. And that is what Constantine does here. Um, he saw himself as continuing the great tradition of the most celebrated emperors of the past. Uh, saw himself in the vein of Trajan, of course, Hadrian, uh, Marcus Aurelius. And in fact, um, he was so adamant about this that the artists who created this arch are going to go to um, various monuments uh, raised to Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius. And they are going to literally chip out um, images of these great past emperors and then literally place them on the facade of the Arch of Constantine. And I want you to think about what this means uh, when someone does this. Um, literally, um, he would use um, an image, let's say from Marcus Aurelius, and then remove the head of Marcus Aurelius and place the head of Constantine on the top. This is, as I say, it's called spoilia. Um, and in doing this, of course, he's consider con continuing himself within this tradition. But it's a very kind of interesting phenomenon that we really don't see in Rome until this point. Uh, what is this saying about kind of innovation, creativity? Um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, right? And also this kind of idea of melange, right? Or mixing and matching. And certainly this is something that we're familiar with in our own postmodern period where, um, where everything is kind of a mashup of things that had existed in the past. And this is something that we just start to see occur in Rome at this time. Um, also, another um, interesting aspect of this <clears throat> is visible here. Um, this is um, a, one of the uh, scenes, which is the distribution of largesse. Um, this was, of course, something that was very important to Trajan. Uh, and Constantine similarly will adopt this practice of giving uh, food uh, to po the poor, something was, was of course popular uh, with um, the proletariat class of Romans. Um, and here is a scene of that, and we can see these figures. And I want to quickly compare it to uh, a scene that we have looked at previously in our course, and that is the panel of the generosity of Trajan. This is, of course, coming from Trajan's arch that we looked at uh, in southern Italy in the modules. Now, let's look at the difference in the way that these uh, two are constructed, right, or crafted. And it's kind of reminding us of the difference that we saw in the pedestal base of the column of Antoninus Pius. Um, on the right here, we have this kind of extraordinary naturalism, right, as figures are very um, full-bodied, there's high relief, the way that we can see a sense of three-dimensional form, the way that that kind of um, uh, panel that's holding the bread kind of extends into our three-dimensional space. And let's look at that compared to Constantine's. 
um, panel of the largesse where we have Constantine here, not kind of one amongst the group, but rather kind of hieratically sitting here in the center while people on either side kind of turn their head to him. Uh, they're very stylized, they're very flat, right? Figures here kind of look upward. We get the, that sense of kind of like doll-like figures looking upward, uh, not unlike uh, the figures that we saw in the Decursio uh, in the column of Antoninus Pius. And interestingly, this becomes a phenomenon that we see this kind of interest um, in other sources and a moving away of the type of naturalism that has been a hallmark of the classical period into a kind of an interest in these kind of flat, abstract, much more, um, uh, two-dimensional forms. Why might people be interested in this? And there's many theories. Originally, um, the kind of the line in our history was this was a you know a collapse of Roman uh, culture, the kind of judgment uh, that we now kind of frown upon. Um, now it's more interesting to ask, you know, what what are, what are they looking at? Why why do we see the emergence of this kind of two dimensionality in Roman art? Uh, some have suggested that there was an influence of art styles from the East that favored this kind of flatness of form, these kind of abstract forms. Um, others suggest perhaps that um, this was a style that derived from the lower classes. Um, and also a style that maybe spoke to people of the lower classes um, uh, more uh, directly uh, than the naturalistic style that we associate with the earlier Roman period and, of course, derives from um, ancient Greece. Um, so these are two theories. Why this becomes interesting at this point is, of course, also very interesting. Um, and, of course, what we see kind of on the horizon of the Roman world is the adoption of Christianity. And it's no coincidence that Christian art will be extremely flat, two-dimensional, abstract. Um, the Christian world really shuns the kind of physical expression of the uh, uh, physical sensibility of being in the world, right? In the, in the Christian religion, there's this idea um, of kind of a spiritual sensibility, right? That the spirit is privileged over the bodily experience. And it's at this point that we start to see the body becoming much more flat, uh, less present uh, in works of art and having here this shift occurring at the same time that we see Roman art or the Roman world convert to Christianity um, is, um, is very interesting indeed, and this will be something that we'll be looking at more uh, in our next uh, module on late antique, early Christian, and Byzantine art. Okay, food for thought, and I'll see you uh, in the next module. Where are you, little prompt?